Okay, hello everybody. I hope you've had a nice break and you're ready for some speed networking. Uh, I'm Jassy Draculich. Um, I'm an early career plant health professional working at the RHS um, and I'm chairing this session as it is intended to build on uh, the great work that was started at the Plant Health Future Leaders Summit back in 2021. Um, that summit was intended to be uh, a group um, of early career professionals and early career scientists, stakeholders across different disciplines. And uh, sorry, just is my, can you actually hear me? Yep. yep, can you hear me? Yep. Okay, cool. Just checking. <laughs> Everything was very still for a moment and I just had a worry I was talking to a black hole. Um, but yeah, so as I was saying, early career professionals working across different sectors, across different disciplines, with the idea of getting them to come together, to get to know each other and to be able to share and reflect on their experiences and their worries and aspirations about the future to help bring each other up around each other um, and make the plant health sector all the stronger for it. Um, at the same time, that gave them the opportunity to interact with the older generation, although I say older, but some of these early career scientists and professionals may be career changers and they can be at different ages um, whilst being at the same stage in their plant health journey. Um, and enabling that interaction with people that are more experienced without judgment um, and sort of handing down that kind of um, that experience uh, to, again, help us all grow a, a more sort of uh, kind of collaborative pr approach. And giving that time to think about the future, challenge it and anticipate for change, um, hopefully giving that chance to yeah, sort of make them realise that the future is in their hands, our hands. Um, and so today, uh, building on those positive experiences, we wanted to give people more of a chance to get to know each other, to build on those ideas and to put themselves out there into their network and get their name and get their work um, out there to discuss. So we've got a series of short flash talks from a range of speakers in different types of roles. Um, and so just to kind of clarify, because these are such short talks, there won't be a QA. and a um, We will be sending around a list of the speaker names and the contact information after the conference. So if you do want to get in touch with these speakers, please do reach out to them. Um, so without further ado, um, if you're ready to go, our very first speaker I'd like to welcome is Morgan Woodring from Ferrer. Are you there, Morgan? Right. So uh, I'm Morgan. Um, so when the Plant Health Summit was uh, going on, I was actually working at Ferrer in uh, pesticide efficacy, and now I'm doing a PhD that's funded by Ferrer at Newcastle and also funded by the Royal Horticultural Society. So that's quite a jump. So uh, I'm going to tell you about what I've been doing for the last year, which is investigating viruses in Andean root and tuber crops, specifically ones that were imported via the internet. So your first question might be, what and they root and tuber crops are. So they're a group of nine uh, botanically diverse plants. They're all from different families. So I've got a few examples here. There's Aracatcha up in the top left. Uh, down there is in, in the middle is um, kind of edulis, which is a relative of canna lily, but you can eat it. And I've put a reference here to a paper that refers to them as underground rayboats because you can see that for tubers, they're very brightly colored. Um, so yeah, the one that I pointed out was top left as Aracatcha, Canna edulis at the bottom. And the one I want to draw your attention to is sort of bottom left, top right, is um, Occa oxalis tuberosa. And that's the one I've been doing most of my work on. So uh, the reason it's sort of come to people's attention is Occa is being grown in Europe right now. Uh, it's sort of part of this general movement of people sort of thinking, grow your own, people growing on allotments and sort of expanding what we've been growing to, to diversify crops, get around monoculture, which is admirable. But you can see this newspaper article here in the top left that's a rather familiar looking ochre. This was something someone shared on Twitter. And um, this particular article uh, points out that Eoco can't be grown here because of pests. And then sort of uh, glosses over that when it comes to <laughs> ochre because there's uh, anecdotal talks say that you know Oka doesn't really suffer from pests but uh, as I will show you it does. <laughs> um, so previously other ARTCs have had viruses found in them so there was a study uh, here at Vera 
that looked into uh, Uyako and looked into Yakom, which is the one on the right here. Um, yeah, it's, it had it had uh, and Emirate and tuber crops had um, these quarantine viruses found in them. So potato leaf roll virus isn't always quarantine, but it is if it's a non-European isolate, which obviously stuff from the Andes is. So this uh, the one that's had three found in it that was Eco, and that was uh, from a small holding in the UK. So there's potato black ring spot virus and then potato leaf virus and non-European. Uh, potato leaf roll virus and then in Yakon this was growing in Hyde Hall an RHS uh, global growth garden uh, that had potato yellowing virus which is quarantine unfortunately so process wise um, I've been using HTS because that was what the previous studies used so it was a case of getting these tubers from in this case eBay <laughs> so because this is sort of looking at how people would be finding them to grow in the UK uh, we used ribosomal depleted RNA because the vast majority of RNA in any given cell is ribosomal. Um, so that meant that uh, the hyper throughput sequencer had a better chance of <laughs> sequencing what we actually wanted and then assembled those 200 base pair reads back into the original genomes and had a look on BLAST to compare it to viruses that we already know about. And in that way, we were able to find some that had between sort of 60 and 70 percent uh, similarity to known viruses which meant that they were probably novel but not so novel that we we're unable to detect them and then the next step after that is uh, finding the viruses within the plants and then trying to biologically characterize them which we'll get into so confirming them wise uh, bottom left here i've got a, a pcr gel and that is as you can see they're quite bright bands so there's uh, the this is a Nipah virus that I found. So I was able to confirm it both for finding which individual plants it was in and also as a way of checking that the assembly hadn't made a chimeric read because there are a couple of spots where it was quite uh, odd in its genome. And by doing this, I was able to uh, make sure that the assembly was right and then find them in the individual plants for further characterization. So on the right here is the qPCR we use. You can see this nice nice curve showing that it is it is present and able to be detected. And so uh, next up is these host range studies, which is just a case of physically putting it into or attempting to put it into indicator plants, uh, which so far hasn't been successful other than one plant. <laughs> it managed to get into one cucumber. Um, and there's, there's possibly looking into nematode transmission work with somebody else here at FERA who's working on uh, bait testing with nematodes. Uh, I've got some references for you on the left there. Um, I think, I don't know if anybody's going to send around the file, but uh, thank you for listening and sorry for the technical difficulties. <laughs> Thank you so much, Morgan. I'm I'm really sorry to have to, to interrupt. I was getting some mixed messages. I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm 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 just I'm just used to Teams. Well, you really showed us how to uh, be completely unflappable and deliver some really interesting research, as well as giving us an insight into your journey and how you got to this point in your career. So, as I said, if anyone wants to reach out to Morgan, uh, contact details, their contact details will be sent round, as will all of our speakers. So, thank you very much, Morgan. Let's move swiftly onwards to our next speaker who is Dr. Rosalind Noble of the British Society for Plant Pathology. Rosalind, are you there? Okay. Hi, so um, I'm Ros Noble. Um, I'm the Policy and Publicity Officer for the British Society for Plant Pathology. Um, and I attended the Plant Health Summit last year because um, if you take in quite a big break that I had in my career, I'm still, was still in the first 10 years, um, and also representing um, the SPP, um, obviously because looking at plant pathology, plant disease, we're um, quite key um, in plant health. Um, so we're a charity, uh, we were fully registered as a charity in 2020, and um, we are actually, we've been running for 40 years as of 2021, um, starting the core of the society started similarly to CABE um, with publishing the Plant Pathology Journal, um, then a Molecular Plant Pathology Journal, 
um, since 2020, we've been publishing new disease reports. So in the same way that Richard was saying about CABI, um, that generates an income and that supports our work. And it also becomes a core part of what the society is about, which is communicating about plant disease. I'm hoping that I can share our video with you. Um, I think the best thing is to try it first and see if it works. So if I click again, can you see a picture of, okay, I'll try see if it works. Okay, so um, hopefully everyone managed to see the video. Um, sorry, that takes up quite a lot of the chunk of time, but I think it's um, it really quickly communicates what BSPP does. Um, and it's also something we've produced um, very recently. It's um, something I did as part of my role with um, Sci Annie, and it, it shows what you can do um, to communicate science, um, plant, sorry, plant health science. Um, animation and videos are really important and powerful. Photos are very important. And it's something that we're keen to encourage our members to do um, is to go out there and share your science. Um, I had quite a bit more I could say, but I think I'm running out of time, Jesse. Yeah, um, we've got Charlotte Nellis coming up next. So uh, yeah, thanks so much, Roz. Um, yeah, the BSPP is obviously uh, organization that many of us here are very fond of um, and want to see continue to, to grow and develop and still keep supporting uh, people as they have been doing. Um, so yeah, if that's everything, Roz, um, I'll let you slip away and please do get in touch with Roz and the BSPP. Um, next up, we have Charlotte Nellist from NIAB. Um, sorry, Charlotte, we are now slipping slightly behind in time, but hopefully we can catch up with ourselves. Um, so yeah, have you got any slides? Uh, yes, I hope I'm sharing the correct screen. Is it full screen? Yep. Yep. Excellent. Okay. Morning, everybody. Um, I'm Charlotte Nellist, um, a pathology program leader um, at NIAB and a bit like um, Morgan, um, I've changed roles since the Plant Health um, Summit. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute, but I just wanted to introduce you to NIAB. For those of you that don't know, we're an independent science-based research organisation. We have headquarters in Cambridge and another research and development um, centre in Kent. Um, we have uh, in total 13 UK regional field trial centres with um, over 100 UK field trial sites, and we drill 
over 140,000 plots um, each year. We employ around 400 staff, including crop scientists, plant breeders, agronomists, and crop specialists. And in the bottom left-hand corner is just a picture of our new um, HQ, which opened in February 2020. Um, as part of my new role, I now uh, manage um, disease trials for variety testing um, that NIAB carries out. So for variety testing in the UK, so to market agricultural crops in the UK, they must be added to the national list. Um, they must pass two sets of criteria. So the first one is DUS, which means they must be morphologically distinct, genetically uniform and stable. Um, they also must show some value for cultivation and use. And so this includes things like um, yield and um, uh, resistance to diseases and um, pests. So um, there's a minimum of two years data that's collected for um, VCU, and we compare the performance of these candidate varieties against varieties that are already on the national list. Um, after the national listing um, for uh, oil seed and cereals, they can then go on to what's called a recommended list. So these are varieties that have the potential to provide a consistent economic benefit to UK industry, and they go on for a further four years worth of um, data collection. So as I mentioned, uh, I'm a plant pathologist, uh, so I manage the disease trials um, for a range of crops at NIAB across cereals, um, legumes, oilseed rape, uh, we also do some potato testing, maize, um, and all of the ratings are produced on a scale of um, one to nine, where nine is, is the best. And um, this simplified um, form of ratings enables farmers to make informed choices about which um, varieties are best for their farms. Uh, another part of my um, current job is I'm the project lead for the United Kingdom Serial Pathogen Virulence Survey. So this is a project funded by AHDB and AFA, and it aims to identify changes in pathogen populations and detect new races that may have an adverse effect on cereal production in the UK. So this is really important because it identifies um, representative um, isolates that are out there within the population that we can then use within these um, national list and um, recommended list screens to make sure that we're screening the next set of um, varieties for UK for the UK against um, current uh, pathogen populations. And the um, project currently looks at wheat yellow rust, wheat brown rust and wheat and barley powdery mildew. So we have samples that are sent in from across the UK on the right hand side is just a heat map showing um, where we've received samples from uh, for ye of yellow rust from last year. And the first step we do is uh, within this project is to identify any population change. So we use um, differential seedling screens. So these we have over 40 accessions with known resistances and we screen a subset of the isolates that come in um, from the survey. We then want to identify the risk that's associated with this change. So we go on to do um, adult plant trials and variety seedling tests, and we screen um, an, a further subsection of these isolates on um, the RL, the recommended list of varieties and the recommended list candidates. We're also implementing, implementing um, genotyping for wheat yellow rust. So, um, this is based on 242 um, diverse genes within the um, rust genome. And we build phylogenetic trees to look at the relationship between isolates. So I'm sorry, I don't have the time to go through this figure in, in detail, but it's something that we've recently generated. And um, this um, genotyping method enables us to easily group um, our isolates into the different genetic groups. And all I want you to take away from this slide really is that the majority of our isolates that we see in the UK across the last three years are in this red genetic group. But within this genetic group, we see actually a broad range of virulences. So um, despite them being very genetically similar, there's a lot of um, diversity within that. And um, we see this across Europe as well. So we're part of a, a program called RustWatch. Um, and data is collected from across Europe. And um, the red group on this figure is, is now in pink. And across the years, so from 2013, um, right up to, well, let's ignore 2022 at the moment, there's only seven samples, but this group of isolates is spreading widely. <clears throat> 
So I just want to thank all the people that are um, involved in this work. Uh, and if anybody has, is interested and would like to talk to me, please do contact me. And for my final few seconds, I'd just like to plug that we're hosting the 16th International Cereal Rust and Powdery Mildew Conference in Cambridge um, later this year. All the information can be found on the NIAB website. Um, and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Charlotte. That's so fascinating and great to see again how your career is sort of taken uh, taken different turns and, and moving back up to to, to cereals up in uh, in Cambridge. Okay, Thank next you. up we have Dr. Lawrence Bramham. Are you there, Lawrence? Yes. Um, so essentially, I am a PCR postdoc working at Rockhamsted Research, and I wanted to just give you a general bit of a flavour of the sort of work that we actually pursue at Rockhamsted. So very recently, we've actually had a giant um, restructuring of the um, um, entire department to into five strategic areas. I can send to tell you what after the, um, the session presentation through, and you can review all of those areas. But in terms of my work, I fall under the protecting crops and the environment umbrella. So in that topic, we work on a lot of um, pest interactions, as well as wheat crop genomics, which is where specifically my um, work is involved with. I'm technically um, working in the AFID BYDV interaction subgroup, where we um, look at how BYDV resistance can be um, um, explored as well as AFID resistance. And this involves a lot of different aspects of work, looking at uh, genetics, but also what's actually out there in terms of BYDV as an option. So one thing that we've done very recently is of course 2020 and 2021 is um, a sample from the Rottenstead Insect Survey, a series of aphids that were known or suggested to be carrying uh, pathogen dangerous barley yellow dwarf virus. We've taken those forward, sequenced a partial section of the um, viral genome and actually identified that there are some suggested strains of BYDV that weren't known to be present in the UK before now. So that's potentially highly significant in terms of generating disease control, but it's also important in terms of disease diagnostics. So one thing which I wanted to show you as well is that we've got some excellent new CASP-based um, uh, diagnostic methods. So rather than going down by the usual route of traditional qPCR or ELISAs, et cetera, we've actually adapted uh, CASP gene type of chemistry to a semi-quantitative, uh, but mostly qualitative, uh, diagnostic for these new strains that have popped up. Um, so the reason why we've done that route is that CASP is a lot more accessible to industry, but within a more equipped lab, we've also developed methods of generating a semi-quantitative method of assessing BYDV. And in doing that, within a single sample, you can actually tell using this um, unique approach what levels of different strains are actually present in a sample. So that was one topic, and whether anyone would like to reach out to me about disease diagnostics, I'd be very happy to discuss it further. Um, as I say, I'll send out the PowerPoint slides later and can have a proper look. Um, but then the other topic I was going to discuss was actually aphid stylectomy and sampling flow and tissue specifically. So aphids are brilliant in that they're able to access tissues that which we simply can't without being overly destructive. So by using a technique called electrical penetration graph testing, where we hook the aphid up to a uh, that's highly calibrated, we can actually assess when the aphid is feeding on specific tissues. And then by zapping it at a certain point and cutting off the video mouth parts, this can allow direct access to flow tissue. So there's lots of potential things that this can be used for. Uh, we've had quite a bit of interest already in this topic, but I imagine people looking into from specific compounds or um, effectors, maybe microRNAs, maybe even transcriptomics. This could be a really useful resource. So if that's something that you're interested in, then please just get in touch. Um, other than that, I'll leave it for now, but um, just to say thank you to all the funding sources, and you can't see the logos, of course, but um, um, yeah, I won't go through them because I'll forget one of them or a couple of them otherwise. But also thank you very much for RSP organising this event. And I very much hope that we can continue conversations started from last year and also start some more going forwards. Thank you very much. I'll send the slides out now. But sorry about that. Thank you so much, Lawrence. Yes, I completely second that about continuing the conversations. It's such a shame it can't be in person, but hopefully this is a good feedstock to continue those conversations remotely and then we will in some point be together in person in the future during the course of this this grant project our next speaker 
is Carol Vahika Vesson. Loving, loving the headwear. Uh, are you ready to go, Carol? Um, yes, well, in fact, it's graduation ceremony today, so I'm, I'm kind of the lucky one that we're happy that it was online because, in a way, I can jump in and out and go back to celebrate our students. So let me share my screen. Um, let me know if you do see it in the presenter mode. Yes? Okay, yep. perfect. Okay, so I'm aware of the time, so don't worry, I won't take too long of your time. I know you might be looking to have a lunch soon. So, so my name is um, Carol Varek Weissen, and I'm an academic fellow in applied molecular mycology at uh, Cranfield University. So for the, those of you that do know where we are, do not know where we are, if you take a line between Oxford and Cambridge, you're rightfully in the middle, you will find uh, Cranfield. So come and have a look if you if you want to know more about us. And, and today I'm going to a little bit more focus on uh, uh, explaining a little bit of what I do at Cranfield as a part of the Applied Mycology Group. And I focus on deciphering the underpinning mechanisms involved in how environmental fact, uh, factors triggers mycotoxin production. So in fact, for those of you, because some of you may not know what mycotoxins are, uh, if you look at cereals, spices, nuts, for example, uh, they do get contaminated by fungi, and that's things that's something all of you know. <laughs> uh, but these fungi do produce a secondary metabolites uh, that accumulate in the food, and uh, um, these secondary metabolites are usually very toxic. And the ones that are the most toxic or that have been characterized as toxic uh, have regulations in place. Uh, and the challenge that we have is that um, these mycotoxins and the ones that are regulated are mostly tame or stable, so they cannot be uh, removed during the process until you get to the final uh, food product. So we need to uh, act uh, at early stages. So this is where the safety uh, food prevention comes from. So in, uh, in our group, we specifically focus on uh, looking at the environmental condition that you may have uh, at field, for example, but that can also happen post-harvest, uh, or impacting the metabolism of the, the fungi in order to trigger the mycotoxin production that can be correlated or not, but is usually not correlated with the fungal growth. So what do we do? In fact, we have focused our expertise and I particularly uh, focus my expertise on looking at different mycotoxins that are all uh, regulated at the moment. We're looking, for example, at some of you may know desoxynivarenol uh, from uh, the plant health point of view in wheat, for example. But we also look at other mycotoxins, which include aflatoxin, T2 and H2 zeralenon, among others, because and we look at how the fungal, the fungi is impacted by the environment into uh, the production of those, those toxins. So through analytical chemistry, but also uh, I do some uh, gene expression study to see how the transcriptome is impacted by, uh, by these uh, environmental conditions. And this allows us to, to have a, a, an idea of what would be, for example, the good agricultural practices that could be put in place um, in order to uh, develop training for communities and here in an example of a community that we are currently training on the the challenges associated with aflatoxin in peanut in ethiopia and the goal is to develop then uh, um, gender equality uh, training in order to implement solution uh, uh, in the in the communities and and in fact my talk is is concluding by the fact that we want you uh, and I wanted to like give you like express an interest in the sense that uh, I'm sure that all of you have a lot of plant health related projects uh, and, and that those can be linked to the crop quality, of course, for many aspects uh, and might include climate change. But but sometimes uh, and um, and we are all like this, you know, we all focus on our, our on our expertise. But but I'm just opening the door and say, don't forget that there might be mycotoxins. And then if if what you're trying to implement linked to an increase of mycotoxins, then the the farmers will not be able to sell. So keep in mind that mycotoxins do happen, and that if you're interested to have someone that can help you with that, contact me. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carol. What a wonderful talk. Um, yes, of course, mycotoxins are often forgotten, but not forgotten once they've uh, had the impact on the consumers. Um, and moving on to our penultimate speaker, 
uh, I think also working with mycotoxigenic fungi, uh, we have Isabel Sims. Um, Isabel, I see you yeah. there. Are you ready? Yeah. Um, close. I'm not quite working with mycotoxins, but people in my group do. Um, so I'm working on a disease called Rhizoctonia solano, um, and I'm now in my fourth year, so nearly finished, um, of my PhD at the University of Nottingham. And I'm particularly interested in Rhizoctonia solano on brassica crop species, such as oilseed rape. So a little introduction to the disease first, this is what it looks like. It's a soil-borne necrotrophic plant pathogen with a really wide host range across a lot of economically important crops. It's divided into anastomosis groups, which are within the species and are based on reproductive incompatibility and things like pathogenicity. And it's AG21, which is particularly virulent on oilseed rape, so that's the one that I look at. Um, these are the symptoms, so you can see like it kills them really fast, lots of necrosis. Um, classic symptoms are things like damping off, root rot and stem rot. And you can see there's necrotic lesions at the base of the stem um, and you get them on the roots as well. And then the final picture on the right um, is a symptom called wire stem where it really thins um, near the base of the stem. Control is really difficult. Um, predominantly cultural and chemical seed treatments method I use at the moment and there's no known resistance in oilseed rape varieties at the moment. So my PhD has been investigating this and the first thing I did was to test some different varieties to see if there were some differences in the susceptibility although all the varieties were susceptible um, and we did find some differences so some have less symptoms than others not no symptoms but a bit less so promising. I also looked at um, the sclerotia. So Rhizoctonia produces um, these resting structures called sclerotia and they can remain in the soil for a really long time. Um, and when they come into contact with the host, they germinate and start forming infection structures um, and kill the cells really quick. Um, within the most susceptible variety I looked at, um, you're seeing the infection structures forming from as early as eight hours and being quite well developed by 48 hours. But on some of the other um, less susceptible varieties, you're not really seeing that happening within 48 hours. So there's some good differences going on. I then looked at the relative expression of different genes involved in defence pathways. So one that I looked at was ICS1, which is involved in salicylic acid synthesis. Um, and this had higher relative expression um, for the most susceptible variety. And similarly, for an auxin responsive protein that I looked at, um, again, it was highest for the susceptible variety. So it looks like susceptibility might be linked with salicylic acid and auxins. However, the two varieties that showed less symptoms, they showed an increase in this gene called PDF1.2, um, which is linked to ethylene and jasmonic acid. To back this up a bit further, I got some mutants in Arabidopsis, which had uh, mutations in key defence pathway genes, um, and tested them with Rhizotonia, and this is the wild type on the far left, and some of the mutants did show much better growth than the wild type, so knocking out some of those defence genes does help the plants do a bit better. Um, I wanted to explore this a bit further, particularly with the link to auxins, because we know that some AGs for Rhizoctonia produce PAA, so the most common auxin that we usually look at is called IAA, but there's another auxin called PAA and there's some others as well, um, and this is known to be produced by some um, strains of Rhizoctonia. We don't know at the moment whether it's produced by AG21, but hopefully I will find out. Um, and what particularly interested me is this, mucin, uh, this mutant AUX1, um, which is a mutant for auxin transport, and normally it's agravitrophic, so it can't respond to gravity, it doesn't know where down is, um, and it just grows a bit at random, often around in circles. But when you infect it with the pathogen, it grows a bit more straight. Um, and at the moment, we don't know why, but I'm working on finding out. And then the final bit of my PhD, um, prior to me starting at Nottingham, my group carried out a GWAS to try to identify some candidates um, that might help increase resistance or tolerance to Rhizoctonia and they identified a few in Arabidopsis and I'm now working with the tilling lines in Brassica Rapa to confirm whether these might be helpful for resistance in the future. 
So thank you very much to everyone in my group. Thank you also to Ranjan, who's been helping me with the auction work. Thank you to the BBSRC and the DTP programme here at Nottingham for funding me. And yes, please do reach out if you want to chat further about anything to do with this. Um, yeah, I've put my Twitter and my email here as well. Thank you. Thank you, Isabel. Some really fascinating research there and some really interesting leads that you're still looking into. Um, yes, so thank you very much. Next up, we have Dr. Helen Rees of the Scottish Rural College. Hello. Hello. Can see you. Can you share your screen? Uh, yes. Yep, got the programme. Okay. All right, are you seeing the um, slideshow? Yep. Thank you. Fantastic. Okay, so uh, like a few other people, I have also changed roles since the Plant Health Summit that we did, and I'm now a postdoctoral researcher in the crop protection team at SRC up here in Edinburgh. And today I'm going to talk about a project that I've only just started, which is looking at biological control of fusarium by treating the crop debris. So um, fusarium in cereals is caused by a complex of both fusarium and macadokium species and it could result in three major diseases, things like fusarium seedling blight, fusarium foot rot and fusarium head blight and it can affect many of the cereal crops that we grow in the UK like wheat, barley, oats, rye, triticale and other grasses. So why is it important? Well, it can reduce yields and grain quality. That's not so important. It's the mycotoxin contamination of grains, which have kindly already been introduced for me, that make fusarium an important disease. It can result in the grains being unsafe for human consumption or being able to be used in animal feed, and it can interfere with the malting process. So if we consider the ways in which fusarium is spread, we can look at how we could potentially break that cycle using biological control agents and integrated crop management to control the disease. So fusariums can be spread through seed infections, although there are seed treatments available that mean this isn't a primary mode necessarily. But fusarium can also overwinter in uh, grass weeds, volunteers and survive in the soil. But importantly for the project that I'm doing, fusariums can overwinter in crop debris. However, the fusarium survives, it can infect seedlings, resulting in poor establishment, or if the seedlings do grow, it can attack the, attack the bases of the plants, causing these brown lesions. Generally speaking, in the UK, we don't have major problems with foot rot, but as the season progresses, the fusarium can splash up the plant, and if you have the right environmental conditions at flowering time, you can result in ear blight symptoms. This closes the loop of the life cycle or the infection process and can result in infection being passed on if susceptible plants are being planted in the future. And so what I'm considering is how farming practices might result in what happens to the crop debris and how this might result in the pathogen being passed on. So here we've got pictures of two extremes of how we would treat fields. You might have farmers practicing direct drilling where the seed is just planted straight into the soil without any of the soil being cultivated and turned over, meaning that the crop debris are still present at the surface of the soil and any fusarium could be passed on. Where you've got ploughing, which is the other end of the spectrum, the crop debris are completely buried into the soil, meaning that there is less risk, although there is still a risk, that fusarium could be passed on to successive plantings. And in between these two extremes, you have things like minimum tillage and conservation tillage, where the soil is turned over, but not as deeply. And so you can still get this spread of fusarium infection occurring. So, I've just finished a pilot study looking at whether or not I could replicate these different farming practices in just a small pot. So I inoculated straw with fusarium and then I did four different things. I had the control treatment where there were no straws and I had straw that was put onto the top of the pot to represent di direct drilling. And then I mixed straw with soil either at the bottom of the pot to represent plowing or at the top of the pot to represent a sort of minimum or conservation tillage. And the results from this study, when I harvested the plants, I took isolations from any of the fusarium-like symptoms and found, perhaps unsurprisingly, that 
where straw is at the top of the pot for direct drilling, you have the most number of fusarium-like cultures. And I'm in the process this week of confirming those, morpho those cultures uh, to work out which fusarium species they might be. But this is ideal because it means that I can take this pilot-based pot study, I've shown that it works, and I can sort of screen different biological control agents and work out whether it would be possible to apply a biological control agent to the straw or the crop debris and see if this would limit fusarium infection being passed on through those crop residues to the successive plantings. And so I'm going to be looking at using commercially available biological control agents, things like Serenade, some Trichoderma species, AQ10, and potentially other biocontrol agents to find out whether this would be a way that we could use integrated pest management to control fusarium infection, particularly if different cultivation practices are being used by farmers because these are becoming more and more common. Um, so I'd just like to thank this um, Scottish Government Resource Project for funding this work as part of the Developing New IPM Tools Project. And if you want to get in touch, my email is here and it will be sent around later. So thank you very much. Thank you, Helen. Some more really interesting work. Um, and yes, that concludes our flash talks for today. Um, yeah, again, I'd second what Helen was saying um, and also thank all the other speakers as well and remind you that they are welcoming people to get in touch with them. Uh, these are people that have recent, often recently changed role. They've got new budding research ideas. They want to collaborate with people. They want to have conversations that grow their ideas, share their interests and start making research that isn't just kind of bedded down into silos, but really breaks out of those sort of those kind of views that you get trapped into when you're working on the same thing for a long time and make sure that the research that is being done is yeah, it's cross cross disciplinary and relevant and really exciting going forward. So they would love to hear from you. They'd love to have conversations with you about their work. Um, and those details will be sent around after this session.